one of the main global programs of the People's Health Movement and it's about putting together the knowledge from the movement about critical health issues and health struggles in the world into a publication. Uh, it's a collective work of many, many people in different countries. Um, this edition, we called it In the Shadow of the Pandemic. It's the sixth edition and as soon as we started working on it, the global pandemic uh, happened in the world. So we had to take this into account, uh, both in the fact that people were dealing with very complex situations on the ground and also uh, in our analysis, because the pandemic in a way amplified many of the inequalities that we, that we talk about in the book. So the book is finally being published and we're very happy to release it. And uh, it's been written by over a hundred contributors from different parts of the world, uh, over 25 countries and all voluntary contributors and as its predecessors it's divided into sections so we have first section dealing with the global political economic architecture um, analyzing the implications for health of the current system we have a section on health systems and how privatization and different dynamics happening and limiting access to decent health care for everybody um, we have a section on the social determinants or determination of health with focus on uh, aspects such as uh, environment, ecosystem, but also war and conflicts. And then we have a section that watches at how uh, global governance institutions um, exercise their often undue power uh, shaping the health opportunities for people. Um, we, we think that this collective work uh, speaks of our struggles and also speaks to our struggles. So we really hope that it can, uh, in a way, be um, a platform for people to know what uh, health activists and uh, activists for social justice are doing. Uh, and so to basically recognize each other and also build alliances. But also we hope that the analysis in the book can inform and strengthen our struggles for a healthier and more sustainable future. So the chapter I'm going to um, share a bit about is about the COVID-19 pandemic and healthcare privatization. And here our starting point was that we could already see so much evidence, that's anecdotal evidence, that the privatization of health systems had affected the preparedness of healthcare, healthcare systems around the world, and that was undermining the ability uh, to timely and effectively control the pandemic and manage the health and social consequences. But we wanted to gather more evidence to have more solid um, information that we could share and, and, and systematize. And in that process, we also wanted to see how those processes were also um, seeing the emergence of new trends of specific forms of uh, roles that the private sector was taking in the health um, care sector. So we looked at different parts of the, the health care sector. Um, we started looking at public health services and functions. Um, and both the privatization um, that before the pandemic and then the trends of privatization during the pandemic. And in this sector, we really saw that over the last years, 25 years or so, um, the basic... Okay. Sorry for the confusion. Um, the basic public health functions have been gradually eroded in high-income countries, in middle-income countries, in low-income countries, because the government was not prioritizing that area. It's not seen as an area that provides for resources. So it was kind of left for itself. So um, testing, tracing, data management, even communications functions were not covered adequately by um, the public sector. And as the pandemic came, many of them were outsourced to the private for profit corporations. Communication functions were not and were really left for no one to take care of them. Um, and I think we've seen a lot of the implications of that when vaccines came around where people in communities felt that they didn't have the information that they required, um, lack of trust 
with the public health system made that you have um, hesitancy in, in, for instance, going for the the the, the public health um, advices that were there, or so, for instance, for vaccines. But in other areas such as testing um, or contract tracing, really um, it was outsourced to um, the private sector. Um, testing was mostly a private individual responsibility. If you want to get tested, you go yourself. It's not part of a public health strategy, really. And that also means that um, the out-of-pocket payments are important, or sometimes uh, health insurance would cover it, um, but it's not part of a public health strategy in itself. In contract tracing, um, it was, again, very often uh, contracted out to private providers or in partnership with private providers. And what this also allowed is to have an amount of data um, that needed to be analyzed and managed that was just falling into the hands of the private sector. And there were a few um, um, cases where that led to controversial situations and um, um, yeah, to serious concerns, for instance, with the company uh, Palantir that was working in the UK and in Greece, and where the Greek government terminated the contract due to concerns on the privacy of the data that was collected um, and opposition that was raised. So these are new elements of this question of um, who holds the data and the amount of health data that is available. Those trends are really uh, increased a lot during the pandemic. I will be presenting or speaking about uh, the uh, chapter uh, 1B, which is on universal health coverage and uh, the primary health care divide. Um, and as we all know, you know, I mean, uh, UHC or universal health coverage has become one of the, you know, major health strategies, you know, in the mainstream policy um, and health uh, uh, dialogue which is being pursued by global um, health actors and, 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 and by countries. Um, and its discourse is driven by uh, organizations such as the World Health Organization um, and the World Bank and other uh, global institutions. Um, so the genesis of universal health coverage was already discussed in the previous uh, global um, health watches. And uh, this, uh, the analysis in the previous reports uh, basically highlighted the difference between, uh, you know, um, what is meant by universal health coverage and the um, uh, uh, difference between that and comprehensive primary health care. And um, so just to remind ourselves, you know, in uh, when you talk about comprehensive primary health care as uh, written and espoused in the um, Alda, uh, Almata Declaration, you know, it spoke about um, uh, preventive, promotive, reha rehabilitative um, health care uh, with a prominent role for community participation, community health workers, and also a role for governments uh, to be responsible to provide these services. In contrast, the UHC policy approach focuses simply on financial protection and uh, argues explicitly, uh, you know, for public but single payer financing, but not necessarily uh, a public provider or public provisioning of uh, health services. And um, so, in a sense, you know, the the UHC discourse, especially uh, you know the dominant UHC discourse, uh, uh, you know, seems to be favoring uh, market based on neoliberal uh, reforms. So the chapter basically, uh, you know, tracks uh, traces the development, um, the policy uh, developments within UHC uh, during the period 2015 and 2020. And reflects on the implementation and driving the uh, its implementation and driving the global health agenda. It also uh, sort of uh, touches on the pandemic because as we were finishing writing the chapter, um, you know, we we were into the pandemic and we also we've um, discussed uh, what learnings or you know what priorities in terms of financing could the pandemic uh, sort of bring forward. And then uh, it is uh, the, the chapter assesses in more detail how UHC um, as a concept is being implemented, especially in uh, lower and middle uh, income 
countries and it uh, does it in a critical approach uh, in a critical manner because there is a problematic approach in the way UHC is implemented um, uh, with a focus on purchasing of services from the private sector through health insurance schemes or other kinds of public private partnerships in which the public i mean the the money is public but uh, the provider um, is 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 from the private sector um and then we go on um, and just to uh, just to add that you know this chapter uh, uh, so the co um, author i mean uh, and and the other contributors of this chapter was uh, remco uh, van der pas and um, and and also and we took from a lot of the documents uh, of various networks uh, which are involved uh, within phm and the um, health systems thematic circle um uh, so uh, so we track some of the major developments for example the un high level uh, meeting on uhc that happened in 2009 we also highlight uh, how within uhc policies the health workforce um you know is not um i mean is is uh, i mean is taken as given and the uhc policies basically focus on financing without at all looking at the way health systems need to be strengthened and with you know the health workforce as a core uh, you know component um of that um so uh, we find um you know and and we go on to give examples in terms of the implementation of uhc see the universal health coverage uh, model um, in strategic uh, purchasing through publicly uh, funded health insurance schemes in which we see that you know this new wave of insurance schemes under universal health coverage which is mainly being uh, implemented in countries of the global south are very different from the way social protection or social solidarity has been visualized in you know high income countries um or um so um so in in a, so so this new wave of insurance schemes you know basically the rationale is to reduce financial burden uh, through efficiency quality competition between providers and you know uh, giving a choice to people so really using a lot of the neoliberal language and concepts um in order to um uh promote uh, these schemes and 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 there is an explicit objective of favoring the private sector and the commercial health sector um in the objectives of such schemes um and and it is also you know the implementation is supported uh, by a lot of the global um actors for instance the gate gates foundation philanthropic capitalists um such as them um and uh, you know the world bank the adb and many other um uh, you know such agencies which focus on developing capacities for strategic purchasing um of services from the private sector and when we see uh, especially i mean we we give some examples of um uh, countries such as india indonesia uh, philippines morocco kenya uh, in which we find that you know the failure of such publicly funded health insurance schemes in uh, low and middle income countries is mainly seen in the dominant uh, model of purchasing clinical care from the for private sector and um, and and we find that and we discuss how private provisioning of healthcare really destroys any advantages of public financing um of healthcare and how coverage uh, in asian countries especially we find there is coverage through insurance schemes which has been increasing however it does not result in financial protection it does not uh, you know result in uh, equitable access uh, to health services uh, in fact there have been patterns of unnecessary um you know surgeries such as hysterectomies and cesarean sections uh, which have happened uh, and which women have been subject to as uh, you know because the private hospitals want to uh, make money out of these um uh these in, in in insurance scheme um and so insurance as a mode of financing and incentivizing hasn't really worked in the public sector and it has actually exacerbated the problems that people um face in the for private um sector and as a result of this funding going to private sector for instance in india the insurance the national health insurance scheme that we have uh, more than 75% of that money goes to the for profit private sector and that means you know less and less money is available 
for investment into the public sector, which in fact, you know, caters to the most vulnerable and marginalized communities. It caters more to indigenous communities, to families living in rural areas um, and other marginalized group, uh, groups. Thank you.